So we're going to read the uh, first eight verses of John 12, and we'll talk about it a little bit today. Okay, John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Then he said, not that he, or this he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare or took away what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. Okay, so we've got a situation where in the first verse we're given a context of time. And that's the first thing I want to call your attention to uh, about this, this lesson today. We're going to be talking about the dinner, but the context of it is that this is the last week of Jesus' life, the very last week. Now, this is pretty amazing, and it's true of the Gospel of John, I think a little bit more so than the other Gospels. But all of the Gospels, okay, each Gospel spends great detail in describing the last week of Jesus. So I just told you we're in John chapter 12, right? This is just a simple way of understanding this. Well, there's, I think, 21 chapters in the Gospel of John. And we're at chapter 12. And yet we're, the, the rest of the whole Gospel is all about that last week of Jesus' life. And, and the, the events, you know, uh, uh, at, right after that, the resurrection and things like that. So, yes, Terry. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I know. There's too many Marys, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and we'll, we'll get into that, but yeah. Okay, so we've got the last week of Jesus, um, and, and we've got a lot of detail about this last week. And we say, well, why did John make a point of telling us exactly when this was? Six days before the Passover? Well, I don't know the exact answer to that other than, hey, it puts, it puts me in the right frame of mind knowing that Jesus' ministry is coming to an end. And so, and, and I have, you know, everything that Jesus ever said, whether, it's, whether it was day one of his ministry or at the very end, you know, is, is truth and is deeply, deeply meaningful. And yet, from my humanness, the things that he said at the very end just almost put a, a, a there's a uniqueness and a spe specialness to the importance of what's going on in his life and the things that he said. And we're going we're gonna to see a lot of that in, uh, going on in through this book, okay? So, we find ourselves at a dinner. This is a celebration dinner. That's the title of the whole you know, uh, uh, lesson this week, a celebration dinner. There's a CC in front of that. That was, a, uh, that, that was probably a sneeze on the keyboard that I created those two Cs right there. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it, uh, ignore that, okay? So it's a, it's a celebration dinner. Well, what were they celebrating? What do you think? What were they celebrating? The raising of Lazarus. Jesus had left pretty quickly, 
after that happened, but now he's back at Bethany, and they said, now we got a real chance to celebrate what has happened. And of course, that is the raising of Lazarus. So we got a celebration dinner going on to commemorate and to, and to just, uh, uh, you know, the best word is celebrate, to celebrate the fact that Lazarus, who was dead, is now alive. And in fact, what did we read there in the, in the scriptures? Was he there at the dinner? Yes. Yeah. Lazarus himself was at this dinner, seated at the table with Jesus. And so we have all three, remember? Three people lived in, in, uh, in, in Bethany, and Jesus uh, apparently used their house as a home base when he was in that area, right? And those three were Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And we really don't know that much about these people, but we can speculate on some things, and we've already done that a little bit. But it, I, I think the fact that the, these people are still, you know, associated with, with Jesus. Now, on the part of Lazarus, man, it, it was almost like, you know, um, he didn't really do much except die. <laughs> you know? And get raised again. And, and neither of those things was probably his idea. Right? It wasn't his idea that he dies. And it wasn't his idea that he get rose from there. So he was, he's like, hey. And somebody, you know, we, we speculated, you know, that Lazarus in, in, might have had uh, opportunity to complain because now he's got to die again. Right. He's got to die twice. <laughs> you know? And if there's anything, you know, as, as Christians, I hope you're of the mindset and the belief that if you're a child of God, you don't have to worry about the consequences of your death. But we all tend to go, man, I, I hope I don't have to suffer, you know? I don't hope I have to go through these, these things about, about, about dying or whatever. Well, you know, I don't know what kind of death Lazarus had in the beginning. And the scriptures, as far as I know, doesn't tell us how he died the second time. But, but he did, you know. Um, so anyway, but, but this family is still intact. And yet there's something different about this celebration dinner and Jesus being at Bethany. Something different about it. It was at Simon the leper's house. It was not at their house. Now, John does not tell us this. But if you go to Matthew's account, is it? No, Mark's account, chapter 14. It's where Mark describes this same dinner. Mark does tell us that this dinner was at Simon the leper's house house. Once again, Jesus breaking the rules. How is he breaking the rules? Culturally. He went to the lepers. What's, what's the big deal about that? Don't associate with lepers. They're unclean. Now, here's the question that I don't know the answer to. Had Simon's leprosy been cured, or was he still a leper? The only answer to that is, it doesn't matter. Either way. Uh, I tend to believe that maybe he had been cured. And if he had been cured of his leprosy, there was, only, there was only one cure for leprosy around, right? It was Jesus. He was the only cure for leprosy. So if he had been cured, perhaps Jesus had, had cured him. That's, that's a, a distinct possibility, Okay. So now Jesus is at his house. But regardless, there was still we, this, this word that you probably understand. We, we use it today, too. There's still a stigma attached. It's almost like um, somebody who was wrongfully convicted of a crime, a felon. They may have even spent time in prison. My wife gives me a bad time because I'm kind of hooked on true crime television shows, you know? 48 hours. Man, I love 48 hours. Because in an hour, they'll take you through a whole crime that somebody committed. And you're usually upset if they don't catch the guy in the end, right? But sometimes, somebody's wrongfully convicted. And they may spend time, sometimes 10, 20, 
years in prison before they're finally found to be innocent. And they get out of prison, and there's a big celebration. I'm sure those families have dinner, and yet there's still some kind of a stigma because sometimes the family of the murdered victim or whatever it is, they, still, they can't quite accept the fact that this guy who they thought was guilty is now innocent. So there's a stigma. Maybe there was a, you know, culturally a stigma in this uh, idea that, you know, because what did people believe about a leper? And, and, and as, this was true of a lot of other things too, but what did they believe about, about somebody who had leprosy? Okay. Yeah. It's your fault. What did you do? Like Job's friends. What sin did you commit? Right? Something like that wouldn't happen to you if there wasn't, you know, so anyway. But Jesus is there. He's at the house of Simon the leper. And Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they are all there. Specifically mentioning each one of them. Okay? Now, what are we told about Martha? And this particular celebration dinner that they're having? She served, yeah. Now, we're also told earlier in the Gospel of John about another time in which Jesus was at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house. And what was Martha doing then? Serving. Serving. And what was her attitude then? This is not fair. Mary's doing nothing. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is not right. What is, what is her attitude now? We don't, we don't have any negative. Nothing negative is said about Martha. I kind of think that she probably learned a very valuable lesson. And this is true of us today. What do we sometimes talk about in the Lord's church? That we, we need all different kinds of people with all different kinds of, of talents and abilities. And what do we call those things sometimes? Gifts. Gifts of the Holy Spirit, right? And some people have a gift for this, and some people have a different gift for that. And we need everybody. So there are some people that have the gift of serving. We have, I, I, if I tried, I could, I could count up quite a few people that have the gift of serving in our church here. And I thank God for that, uh, that, that we have that. We have uh, others that have the gift of of teaching, teaching our kids in Sunday school that's going on right now, and all the way up to, uh, obviously, to, uh, to adults and to creating situations in which we can, we can help each other learn from the Word of God. Um, gift of working with youth. Man, you know, everybody thought, you know, because I, I surrendered to preach when I was 14 years old. And I tell you what, I tried working with teens while I was still a teen, and I was lousy at it. I could not relate to teenagers even when I was a teenager. Technically a teenager, you know, 18, 19 years old. It's like, it's, it, why? Because I knew how they thought and I didn't have patience for it. <laughs> now, pastors told us many times that he was a youth worker and I, I, I have no doubt that he was great at it. I, I wasn't, I guess I was an old soul when I was, when I was still, you know, uh, a young person. But uh, we all have our different gifts and, and, and talents, and, and Martha probably learned the lesson that she had been gifted by the Lord of somebody who was, who was ready to, had the ability, and was willing to serve. And so we're told here in the 12th chapter that Martha was serving. Lazarus was at the table with Jesus, and then some interesting things start to happen. An anointing. Verse 3. Then took Mary. And yes, this is Mary, the sister of Martha and Lazarus. She took a, a pound of ointment of spikenard. Okay? Very costly. John specifically says this was expensive stuff. Okay? And anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. The anointing. What's going on there? Well, we could say a whole lot about that. But number one, 
Mary gave what she had. Uh, Jesus took note one day of a certain widow going up to the temple. What did that widow do? Anybody remember? She gave two mites. Just think of two pennies. And she gave that as an offering. And it was probably, I guess it was a Pharisee, right? That came up and was putting on, put it on a great show about how much he was going to be able to, to and be willing to give to the temple. And what did Jesus say about that? Yeah, her gift was greater. Was greater than the apparently rich Pharisee that went up there. Does that mean that it's 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 a it makes it bad or impossible or hard to be a true servant of Jesus if you have means, if you have resources, if you're rich? What about that? Not if you give. But here's the key. In order for the rich man to give as much as the widow did, what would he have had to give? No way! There's the heart of it. That's the hard part. What did Jesus say about heaven and rich people? Yeah. How hard is it for a rich man to go into heaven? Why? Because the surrender that it, that it takes. What's that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it is, in a sense, harder to do that. Now, why am I talking about this now? Um, there are those that believe that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, for whatever reason, were well off. They were pretty, pretty rich. And one of the reasons is that Mary had in her personal possession a pound of spikenard. A pound of spikenard. What's the big deal about that? Well, here it is. Spikenard was an essential oil. Now, you, I've never, I've met people that are really super into essential oils, right? They've got stores full of essential oils that they believe has all different kinds of healing properties. I don't know about that. Uh, if there was an essential oil that would, you know, change some things about me overnight, believe me, I'd be putting it all over my body, you know? <laughs> but, but uh, you know, and maybe there are some beneficials about that, but that's, that's what spikenard was, was it was an essential oil, okay? And uh, it was worth a full year's wages. Now, that, trans that translates perfectly to any culture at any time. Because what does a full year's wages represent? Basically represents everything, right? If, if you're a top-notch executive of some big corporation and your salary is in the millions of dollars, that ointment was worth millions of dollars. If you're a blue-collar worker in America now, and, and you may have a, I don't even know what the average salary in, in America is. I would guess it's probably somewhere between forty and $60,000 a year, maybe. I don't know. I can remember right after I was getting married, and people talking about, I'm making $20,000 a year. And I thought, that's all the money in the world, man. Right? $20,000 a year. Hey, we got fast food workers that are going to make a whole lot more than that right now. Sorry, I didn't say that. Anyway, so it's a full year's wages. Mary had this. And it was not fake. Now, I incorporate into the outline there that small print. I'm going to read it for you real quick. But this is a great, great definition that I ran across about this spikenard. So spikenard was an uncommon perfume extracted from grasses that grew in the country of India. Once the juices were squeezed out of the grass, they were dried into a hard, lard-like substance. Turning that lard-like substance into perfume was a very lengthy and costly process. 
If you add to this the cost of transporting spikenard from India to other parts of the world, you can see why this particular perfume cost so much money. Now, spikenard was so expensive that few people could buy it. Most had to buy one of the many cheap imitations available. There's always imitations available, right? But the word used in John 12, 3 tells us that Mary didn't bring Jesus a cheap imitation. She brought Jesus the real thing. An ointment so valuable that it was normally reserved and used only as gifts for kings and nobility. This was the gift Mary brought to Jesus. Now, when she brought it, what did she do with it? She poured it out. How much of it did she pour out? All of it. She poured it all out. A pound of this um, essential oil over the feet of Jesus. What does it say happened after that in the house that they were in? The whole house was full of the fragrance of this spike nard. Mary gave, she was willing to give it all. And she did. And that says a lot. That says a lot about what Mary did. But she also humbled herself. How did she humble herself in this process? Right. Which meant she had to have, she probably had very long hair, but she had to have taken it down. So in Jewish culture, it was improper for a woman to wear her hair down in public. That was only something she did in private. But she loosed her hair, let it down, and dried his feet with her hair. This is showing that she humbled herself by letting her hair down. That it, it would have perhaps been something known as a shameful thing for her to do. And yet, and yet she did that. So because of this, Mary has a testimony today. We're standing here in the year 2024 talking about Mary. And what is her testimony? Well, we could, we could say different things. Like I said, we don't, we don't really know that much about her. And yet, there is a testimony of her. What did Jesus say? Um, let's see. Is it in this one or one of the other? I think it's in one of the other gospel accounts that, that it is said that because of what she did, this would be spoken of, you know, for a long, 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 long time, okay? And maybe it was in that Mark account where it talks about her testimony because of what she did this. But here's just one way of thinking of what, what Mary's testimony was. And it's all about at the feet of Jesus, right? The first time we see her at the feet of Jesus was during that first dinner. And what was she doing? She was learning. She was learning of Jesus. Jesus was the greatest rabbi that ever walked the earth. What was a rabbi? A teacher. He was the greatest teacher that ever lived. Simply by being with him, you would learn. Now, Excuse me, i got to grab Kleenex. So what does Jesus, is there anything in scriptures to tell us that this principle should still exist today? Okay, that's a good one. Study, right? Learn, right? What else? Anything Jesus himself might have said. I'll start it. You can finish it. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy burden. And what else did he say in there? 
I'll give you a rest. But in that, in, in that same phrase, learn of me. Learn of me. Come unto me. Learn of me. Jesus, the great teacher. We need to spend time with Jesus today. We need to spend time with him. How do we do that? Well, we got we to gotta know about him, learn, which means study, which means find out. We're going to learn so much about these, th this last week of Jesus' life that we're going to be looking at in the rest of the Gospel of John is so intense and, 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 and packed full of eternal truths about who Jesus is. We need to learn who he is. Listen to what he says. Observe how he acts. What his relationships in life are like. And as we do that, we allow Jesus to continue to be our rabbi, our teacher. And Jesus and, and Mary did that. She sat at the feet of Jesus and she learned. Secondly, the second time we see her, it's at the feet of Jesus. It's when Lazarus is dead. Martha has already had her encounter with Jesus as Jesus finally gets into the region of Bethany, the town where they lived. And now Mary comes running, and immediately she falls at the feet of Jesus. And she basically says the same thing to Jesus that Mary did. I mean, excuse me, that Martha did. But in that encounter, one of the things that happened to her and is her testimony is that I believe she surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You are Lord. Now, believe me, and this is going to come out over there in a little while. Being, Jesus being your Lord is something separate and different than Jesus being your Savior. Have we surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? Even when we don't understand? How many times in your life have you been going through something and you don't understand why you're going through it? I can't count. How many times? And every time when something like that happens, and I've, I've talked about this, preached about it before, the, the, my first inclination is to say, why? Eh. <laughs> wrong question. I know it's natural, but it's the wrong question. What we need to do is say, Lord, I don't understand. I don't understand why. I don't need to understand why. I surrender to your lordship because you know why. And you will lead me to the place that I need to be. And uh, uh, um, even without my understanding of why I'm on this path at this moment in time. And I've told people this before, and I truly believe it. You need to look on your lack of understanding as a blessing. God does not require you to understand. He just requires you to trust. Simple. Now, th there's a big difference between what is simple and what is easy. Trust is simple. It's not always easy. In fact, most of the time, it's not very easy to trust the Lord in, in the way he guides your life. Mary fell at the feet of Jesus that day, and I believe she surrendered to his lordship. Now, she had a good outcome, right? Right? And that's another th mistake we make. Surrendering to the lordship of Jesus Christ means we honor him as our Lord. We maintain that positive uh, relationship with him regardless of how things turn out. Regardless. Some people think that God only answers your prayers when good things happen. He answers your prayers every time. Yes, no, and wait. That's it, right? So surrender to the Lord regardless of the outcome. 
Because we know in the end, in the end, in the end, if you're a child of God, you win. Now, you can forsake a lot of blessings along the way, and even some blessings that will be enjoyed after the Lord comes back, if you refuse to surrender to the Lordship of Christ. You can forsake, you know, you can lose out on a lot of stuff, but you don't lose your salvation. You will be with him in his kingdom. Okay, and then the last thing, at the feet of Jesus, she honored him. Okay, now, what did Jesus say about this act of Mary when she anointed his feet with spike nard and wiped them with her hair? What did Jesus say about that? At least one of the first things that he said. It's okay. Um, well, let's see. I'm getting ahead of myself, actually. So let's, let's back up and we'll, we'll tackle that. So then the next thing is um, the objection. Seems like there's always somebody that has an objection. There's always somebody that's contrary. You know, I, I use the internet to research a lot of things in my studies. And I guarantee you, you're always going to find somebody that is a contrarian. You're always going to find somebody that seems to have it their life's mission to talk down about something or someone. And sometimes, yeah, you could, you could see, there are, and, and especially if you get in the realm of false teachers, there are people out there representing themselves as a Christian leader, a Christian teacher that are teaching false things. And those things you need to call out. But even in that, it's, you know, it's, it's much more call out the, the teaching rather than condemn the person. Um, so sometimes it is a fine line, and I understand that. But even amongst things that we are not sure about, then there are, believe me, there are gray areas in Christian life and conduct that you're going to have difference of opinions. When you get a bunch of Christians in the same room, you're going to have different opinions about some of these gray area things. And sometimes the, the, um, the differences... You can literally say, and to a degree anyway, that both people are right. I don't know how much time, if I have enough time to get into this, but uh, the, the first century cultural um, controversy amongst Gentile believers and Jews, but in towns, the Apostle Paul, he was going to all these different you know, uh, uh, Gentile towns getting people to, to come to the Lord, and when they came to the Lord, when they, when they embraced Jesus as their Savior, came into Christianity, they usually were coming out of some type of an idolatrous religion. They were coming out of that. And one of the things that was happening was that they, in this idolatrous religion, is that they were, some of these idolatrous religions were were offering animal sacrifices to false gods. Idolatrous, right? Now, what's the big deal about that? Well, you couldn't allow stuff to go to waste. So the meat from those animals, sometimes the priests of the false prophets or the, the, the false gods would use it to eat for their personal, you know, um, substance. But then they would also sell it. It could be at an open marketplace. Imagine yourself going to Safeway and trying to pick out a nice ribeye, not knowing if that ribeye was from an animal that had been offered to a false god. You just didn't know. How do I do that? How do I separate that? How do I know for sure? Unless I grow my own beef, right? And slaughter it or, you know. So 
there was this great controversy. So Christians eat meat that had been offered to an idol. Guess what? Some Christians said, absolutely not. Other Christians says, why not? That idol's nothing. It's not, it's, the idol's not real at all. Who's right? Well, guess what? Both of them are. If, and here's the where you always got to put things in context. If you were a, a Christian who had been saved out of idolatry and you were so you just determined and absolutely turned off by anything and everything that ever was associated with that idolatrous religious system that you believe that if you then ate that meat that you were going back to that system of belief, if that's what's really in your heart, if I eat this meat, I, I'm falling back into idolatry, then it was a sin for you to eat that meat because you believed that you were falling back into idolatry. Now, I don't have time to go through all this scripture by scripture, but this is in the Bible. If you were somebody like the Apostle Paul, who knew that an idol is nothing anyway, and to everything, everything needs to be uh, you know, eaten with thanks, then you had freedom in that. And you were right to go ahead and eat the meat and not worry about it. But then there's a third category. If you were over here in the camp of, it's okay to eat meat that's been offered to idols. And you know that by you doing that, you're going to offend a brother or sister of Christ over here, which is in the other camp. Now you have sinned. Not because you ate the meat, but because you sinned against your brother by offending them. Causing them to stumble. So what do you need to do? You need to pray for your weaker brothers and sisters in Christ that may not have certain freedoms that you personally have so that they can grow to understand that though this is a freedom, it is not something that is necessary and you can give it up at any moment at any time for the love of your brother or sister. This is advanced Christianity. This is, this is you know... What do they call it when you finish your four-year degree and you're, you're into the next phase? What's that? Postgraduate. This is postgraduate Christianity. It's tough to understand everything that God wants us to understand. So here at the, the, the dinner, this objection is made, right? And the objection is, um, why not sell? Why not sell this? Now, how do I get the, the spike nard was worth a year's wages? I get that from Judas's statement um, that it could be sold for, how much did he say there? 300 dinners, and that was a year's wage. So Judas knew how much it was worth. He said it could have been sold, the proceeds given to help the poor. Right? Sounds, sounds kind of logical, doesn't it? We're going to give this to the poor. They need it, right? Okay. But what do we really see? And John makes it clear. He describes the right Judas, because there was more than one Judas. He describes the right Judas, Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray Jesus Christ, so there's no doubt who this is. And he gives us a glimpse into the heart of Judas. And what was that? Dishonesty and greed. How do we know that? What did John tell us about Judas? He, was, uh, he kept the carry the bag. He kept the kitty, right? Yeah. And what would he do? He would steal from it. Yeah. So there's some dishonesty and greed going on in the heart of Judas. Now, believe me, there's a whole lot more than, than that going on in the heart of Judas. Unfortunately, he never did, uh, you know, accept Christ as his personal savior. He never did that. And uh, he became a pawn of Satan. And uh, Satan literally, I think, sort of says Satan entered into him. And uh, he was used. And even in that, even in being a completely depraved situation, being absolutely used of Satan, God was on top of that whole thing, using that to fulfill his purposes uh, for uh, the, the ultimate crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So the argument had legitimate logic to it, right? We could do a whole lot better. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I know it's necessary for us to keep the grounds of this church facility going. 
But when we have to pay what we had to pay to replace this roof, ugh, it irks me. <laughs> when we have to pay to redo the parking lot or do it well, and, and all these thousands and thousands of dollars, did you know, I'll tell you what really irks me. We've got a four, how much, how, how big is the, the trash receptacle we got? Four yards. You know how much we pay for four yards every month? I think it's gone up, actually. What the, the, the figure I remember that I'll never forget is $666. That's of the devil, right? <laughs> but I think it's gone up from that. Are you serious? Yes, I'm serious. That's how much we pay, the church pays, every month for that garbage. That irks me. Why? Because I would rather spend that money on ministry. I know pastors the same way. I want that money to go to ministry, to, do, to help people that, 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 are, that have spiritual needs, whether they don't know the Lord yet or whether they already know the Lord and need to grow in him. That's where I want that money to go, and it really, really irks me when we have to spend money on this, this kind of stuff. I understand the necessity, but it's never going to be a feel-good moment. Just like when I have to go buy a new a washing machine instead of new golf clubs. I'm going to feel a whole lot different about those two things. <laughs> I don't feel good about buying a new washing machine. But having that new set of clubs, man, yeah. <laughs> so here we are. It has logic, but without full knowledge. The argument was without full knowledge. What was that knowledge, what Jesus talked about? Uh, and it was also shared by others. Now, if you go to Mark's chapter 14 account, it wasn't just Judas Iscariot that had this reaction. There were others in that dinner with him that had this. Okay? All right. So then finally, Jesus defends Mary. Point number one, acts of love should never be criticized. Mary loved Jesus. That spike nard was hers to give. And it was right for her to do that. Out of the willingness of her own heart, it was right for her to do that. No gift is too much for the Lord. You cannot give God too much. He's already given everything to you. Okay? Mary revealed in this the fate of Jesus. What did Jesus say? She's done this looking towards my death, my burial. Do you think Mary actually had that full awareness and understanding of that? Maybe. You know what? Even if she didn't, it's okay. She was directed by, I, I think her primary was that she loved Jesus so much that she did this for him in response to the fact that he, she had her brother back. Right? But even if she did not totally realize the prophetical implications of her act, it was still true. And, and Jesus mentions that to her as, as part of uh, the, 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 the reason for it. And then he says, you're not always going to have me around. You'll always have the poor around. So in other words, there's plenty of time to help the poor. I'm not going to be around forever as far as, you know, in his current, current state. So, hey... Uh, this does not mean that it's wrong to help the poor. Our church ministry does a few things. We could, we could do better, like any church ministry can, but we do some stuff to help the poor, the needy. We do those things, and that's, that's right. But it, I, it should never, my opinion is that it should never be separate from the more pressing issues Somebody has something going on in their life, and they need, usually in some form, one way or another, they need some money to take care of necessities, whatever it, whatever it may be, okay? 
never let that override another need that they have that's even more important. And that's obviously their spiritual needs. If they don't know the Lord, they need to come to him. And if they do know the Lord, they need to draw closer to him. And be absolutely dependent upon so that no matter what happens, they know that the unchangeable things in their life, God, you are God, you are good, you are loving, you love me, and that relationship that I have with you is never going to change. And that's more important than anything else in somebody's life. All right. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Any uh, questions, thoughts, or prayer requests? Yes. On Wednesday, okay, all right. Thanks for being here, and we'll be in prayer for you. Anything else? All right, Vic, can I can I pick on you and ask you to dismiss us in prayer?